Uh, okay, hope you can see my screen. Okay, so this session is going to be on machine learnings. We are going to go over uh, a couple of machine learning algorithms and uh, look at their implementation. So there was uh, an already prepared slide. I'm going to go over it. Just the basic concepts in the theory of machine learning and the algorithms. Uh, and we are going to dive into the implementation of the algorithms using Google Colab. So uh, machine learning is just a branch of artificial intelligence and it uses computing based systems to make uh, sense out of data. So what machine learning does or tries to do is it tries to extract patterns and fitting data to functions, classifying data and so on. So Machine learning systems can learn and improve uh, with historical data in time and experience. And it brings the theoretical computer science and the real noise data. So based on the data or based on a given data, a machine learning system can learn and try to find some kind of patterns between the data, try to calculate some kind of feature importance from the given data. And finally, based on those data, it can make a prediction or uh, any kind, it might be classification, regression problem, uh, or any other type of machine learning uh, output. So in real life, we use machine learning for different types of purposes. So we see that mostly in Netflix or YouTube, there is a recommendation system, which is uh, an application of machine learning. Uh, you can also uh, see machine learning in games, which is part of machine learning, which is called uh, reinforcement learning, where the algorithm tries to learn uh, based on trial and error. So every time there is uh, a success or it it gets a, a, an output that is positive, it will try to learn based on those outputs and it will try to penalize itself every time it tries to uh, do something, a particular thing. So we can see that there are lots of applications of machine learning in the real life. And Machine learning is classified into subgroups. The one is the supervised learning and the next one is the unsupervised learning. There is also the reinforcement learning, but mainly they are classified into the supervised learning and into the unsupervised learning. So I think we have been seeing this starting from week zero. Uh, in the supervised learning, machines are the machine learning algorithm is taught by, the, by an example or labeled data. So every time we try to train the data, there is a labeled data or uh, an output that you are expecting. So based on those labeled data, the machine learning algorithm can learn and try to predict based on those labeled data. So for every example in the data, there is always a predefined outcome in the models, models the relationship between a set of prescriptive features and the target. And the common types of uh, problems or the, uh, I think this one is three. So the most uh, common types of problems in the supervised learning are the classification, the regression and the forecasting. And in the classification, what we try to do is we try to, we try to classify data based on the labeled data. So for example, the straightforward and the very simple example that we can speak of is the uh, classification, let's say between cats and dogs. So uh, a labeled, we will first have a labeled data which, which contains a set of cats and dogs with their appropriate or uh, with their respective labels. Then the machine learning algorithm will try to learn the patterns and based on the patterns, it will try to predict or classify uh, new data or unseen data uh, based on the uh, data set that was being trained on. And the next one is the regression problem. And in regression, we are not trying to classify the data, but rather we are trying to calculate a specific value from the training data and uh, on the unseen data or on the data that we are going to test it on, we are going to try to predict a specific value from the uh, test set that you are going to work on. And finally, there is the forecasting data. Just forecasting is just the process of making uh, predictions about future based on past and present data and commonly used to analyze trends. And uh, mostly you'll see or you'll get a time series data where the data is labeled based on the time. And we are going to try to analyze or get a specific pattern based on the time series data. So uh, it's mostly used uh, in sales prediction, annual budget income prediction, and so on. So 
based on the trends or based on the data that you have uh, until now, until the present time, we'll try to predict future sales uh, or future revenues that a company is going to generate. So forecasting is mainly mostly used in time series analysis and some other uh, scenarios. So as you have said, the classification predicts which class a given sample of data or sample of descriptive feature is part of. And in regression, it tries to predict a continuous value while in classification, there is a discrete value in the prediction. And in, thus, in the unsupervised learning, there are no predefined and known set of outcomes. So as you have discussed about unsupervised learning before, in unsupervised learning, we are not to predict or we are not training the algorithm based on specific label data. So what the unsupervised learning, machine learning, what the unsupervised learning tries to do is it will try to look for hidden patterns and relations in the data. And based on those data, it will try to classify or cluster. I think the most popular example is clustering algorithm, which will try to cluster or group data uh, based on specific metrics or weights that it thinks it's appropriate for those uh, data. And this is the general uh, life cycle. We can see as yes, the life cycle of any machine learning uh, algorithm building. So the first step or the first thing that should come is defining the objective. So uh, as, you, as you guys have been working in week one and week zero, the first step is to uh, clearly define the objectives and the goals uh, of the machine learning that it's going to be implemented. So I think most of you have been, have been uh, working on the report section and I think you guys have received a, a feedback from the tutors. Uh, I think most of you haven't been focusing on the objectives or the goals and the business understanding of uh, what you are going to work on. But the most important thing in the machine learning uh, life cycle or process is understanding the objectives of what you are going to implement or what you are going to do. Unless you understand the objectives or the goals or the business, what you are going to build next won't be of that age because based on the data that you have or based on uh, the goal that you are setting, you are going to build a machine learning algorithm and the data cleaning process, the data pre-processing process will be based or dependent on the data uh, or the business objective uh, that you are going to set uh, at first. So the first thing is to set or to have a clear understanding of the business that you are going to work on and uh, define measurable and quantifiable goals and using this stage to learn about the problem. So after you understand the problem or learn about the data that you have or the goal that you are going to build, the next steps will be uh, will become much easier. Uh, the data preparation, the model building, model evaluation and the model deployment will be much easier. So first step is to understand the problem and uh, have a clear objective or a clear goal that you are going to work on. So the next step is the data preparation. So in data preparation, as you have seen before, there are multiple steps to be implemented. It, uh, one might be the normalization, the transformation, missing values, outliers. EDA also is also the part of data preparation. So most of the, you are going to spend most of your time on the, on the data preparation step because data preparation uh, needs understanding of the data that you have and uh, doing some kind of transformation, normalization, handling missing values, and handling outliers based on the data that you have and based on the goal of your machine learning algorithm. So that's why understanding the goal of or the objective of the machine learning algorithm or of the data or the business is really important before going to the data preparation. So because based on the objective that you have said before, that you have said before, you are going to make or to prepare the data for your next steps. And on the data preparation part, you normally work on the normalization, transformation, missing value, handling, and outliers handling. The next step is building the model, which is relatively easy compared to the other steps or to the above steps because uh, be taking much of your time. So model building is the simplest step in the uh, entire machine learning uh, life cycle. And
10 types of algorithm that you're going to use on. Okay, uh, and after the model building, the next step is evaluating your model. Uh, on test data and we want to know how our model is performing. So on model evaluation, we are studying models accuracy and work better than the naive approach or previous system and do the results make sense in the context of the program. So we are trying to evaluate what you have built or what we have uh, before uh, pushing it to a production system or to a production uh, repo. So after we are good to go with the model evaluation or our model is good to go, the next step is to deploy our model and this step is an iterative process and we'll go uh, back to the first step which is defining the objective because based on the model deployment we might reevaluate our needs and uh, change some of the features, change some of the uh, properties or parameters that we worked on before we might change the preparation of the data and so on. So this is the entire or uh, the simplest form of the machine learning life cycle. So, uh, on the data preparation, uh, it's needed for several reasons. Some models have strict data requirements. Some might need scaling the data, data point intervals. Some characteristics of the data may impact dramatically on the model performance and so on. So as I've said earlier, mostly in the machine learning life cycle, data preprocessing and data cleaning is the one step that will take most of the time in machine learning uh, building step because in data preparation, it's not only preparing the data. While preparing your data, you will need to visualize your data. And here's where exploratory data analysis comes in. So you will visualize your data, you will understand your data and uh, do some kind of transformation. And after uh, working on some kind of transformation, you might want to look at what you have done. And you might also want to uh, implement another kind of EDA for the transformed data and so on. So it's an iterative process. It, it won't be finished at a one go, but uh, you look back to the loop again and again until you are satisfied or your stakeholders are satisfied. Uh, and the next step is feature engineering. Feature engineering is uh, working on the features that you have and uh, tuning them accordingly. So uh, what we will mostly do is reduce the numbers, fewer predictors uh, means more interpretable model and less costly. So. I think one of the things that uh, you guys have been challenged with on week one was uh, you were feeding the entire features to uh, to the model, but not all features are relevant to the model that you are going to work on. For example, I think what I've been seeing from some of the submissions where uh, uh, some of you were using the ID, the bearer ID and some kind of identifiers and feeding that to the model. but an ID or any kind of identifier won't do that good or won't even have any use in the machine learning because the ID of or the identifier of any kind of or any type uh, won't add value to, the, to that prediction. For example, let's say we are trying to predict or we are trying to classify uh, if an image is a cat or a dog. So if each cat or if each dog has an ID given, those IDs aren't relevant uh, to the to the outcome or to the uh, final prediction that we want to get. So IDs, I think these are just the, ob the, ob the obvious one, but on feature enjoying or uh, feature importance, you'll work more and the algorithm will try also to understand which features are important and which features are not. So when building a male model, it's very rare that all variables or features in the, the, in the data set are useful. and adding redundant variables reduces the generalization capacity of the model, which will also reduce the overall accuracy. So it will not only be uh, pointless to add redundant features that won't be useful to the model, but it will also affect our accuracy in the prediction, uh, the, the prediction result of our model. So we, we should focus on feature enjoying and feature importance uh, before uh, finalizing our model and uh, going to the deployment phase. So on module building, the, the obvious steps are, we'll first split the data for training and for testing. And after splitting data, we might perform some feature selection, then estimating the performance by visualizing and using other metrics. 
And finally, after evaluation, we uh, select the model that you want. So we not only work on a specific model uh, or only a model that we are thinking would be best for uh, our needs, but most of the time you'll be using different model, different machine learning algorithms, and you'll choose what will work best for your data set that you are working on. Uh, even the best data scientist or machine learning engineer won't definitely know which model will perform best uh, uh, from the different models that we have, because you might just think that some of the models are based for specific types of problems or specific types of data sets, but you will you will always want to try every model before uh, going to the production with the uh, trained model with a specific machine learning algorithm. So we will mostly use uh, different machine learning algorithms and we will choose what will work best for our training data. Uh, okay, I think this is it. We can now go uh, to the collab. Any questions? Okay, then. Uh, so you can get this uh, collab notebook from from the Google Drive document and <clears throat> uh, work on it. So uh, the first thing is I've mounted the uh, I've, mo I've mounted my drive so that I will be able to work uh, on the on files from my drive. I will be importing the data set for this specific problem from my Google Drive. This is taking you there. Okay, so the next thing is to uh, import libraries that we are going to use. Uh, primarily, here we are going to use uh, different machine learning algorithms. We are going to see the XGB, the XGB classifier, the decision tree classifier, random forest classifier. Uh, we are going to see over different classification algorithms that are relevant uh, for the tasks that you are going to work on this week. And uh, the other thing that we want or we are interested is on the accuracy or the metrics of the model that we have built. So there are pre-built libraries from the scalar and we we'll use those, uh, uh, those methods to measure or evaluate our data or our result that you have trained. And uh, a, a, a very simple exploration about the data set that you have, I think this is a data from the medical, uh, yes, it's a data from the medical uh, team. I'm not exactly sure what the data is about, but we are trying to look at what we have. So the target consists of zeros and ones, and the total, we have a total about 303 rows, and we can use the describe. So the DF to describe will give us uh, a basic summary of the data that you have, the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum of the data, the quartile, the quantile, and different uh, metrics that you have or what that we want for the numerical columns. Uh, and for the object types, can also use the df.describe and we can include, we can use the include uh, method and by using the include, we will can give the np.object. So, this will give us a summary of the object data types. Uh, and the next thing is encoding. So, uh, so machines or to train any machine learning algorithm, everything should be in numerical form because machines won't understand uh, text or any kind of objects. So underlying any kind of machine learning algorithm is just a zero and a one. So when we are going to train our algorithm, we need to encode it or convert it into a number or a numerical form so that it will be easier for our machine learning algorithm to train our data and give uh, the required output. So there are different types of categorical data that we might encounter. So the first one is the ordinal categorical data, which is, uh, it's a type of categorical data in which order is uh, relevant. For example, let's say, uh, in a ranking or uh, 
yes, uh, maybe in an organization there might be some kind of ranking or hierarchy. There is first the uh, vice president, then the president, and so on. So those types of data require some kind of uh, order or hierarchy. So they are original categorical data. And the other types of data that we might encounter is categorical data with less number of categories. These types of data are categorical, but they have less number of categories. Maybe it might be gender type. So in gender type, there will only have two types of categories, which is the male and the female. So we have less number of categories. And on categorical data, which is large number of categories, we also encounter same type of data, which have uh, lots of categories and we need to handle them separately. We don't encode every categorical columns using the same approach. So we, we are going to uh, look on the different approach that we can use for categorical data with large number of categories and categorical data with less number of categories. So we can use one hot encoding. So what one hot encoding converts the categorical data into numeric data by splitting the columns into multiple columns and it's resource intensive. So we will use one hot encoding when the number of categories in a specific column or feature uh, are not uh, large number and if you have a smaller number of categories in the feature we can use the one hot encoding and the label encoding involves converting each value in the column into a number it won't add any additional column in label encoding but it will only convert the values of each uh, value in that feature into zeros and ones and uh, to the uh, Sorry for that. Is that a question, Mohammed? Yes, I have a question. Uh, actually, I didn't mm -hmm. understand the, the encoding section. Uh, the, the what? The encoding. The section okay, the, 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 right now. Yes, yes, I will explain it uh, in more detail on the next section. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, the label encoding involves converting each value into a column and into a number. So I think it's better to uh, look at some uh, visualization or some image before, uh, uh, instead of just going over the theory. So on, what, on one hot encoding, let's say we have a column and which, with different categories. And this is an island. I think these are different types of islands. And when we use one hot encoding, it will split each of the values in the feature into different columns. So this first value will be a specific or a single column and the next one will also be uh, a specific column and the third one and so on. So how it will order the data is for the first row, it will give a one for this specific column and a zero for the rest. And for each of the features, not for each feature, but for each of the values in that specific feature, which is the Island feature, it will convert them into separate columns. So each column will be ordered accordingly and the values will be filled by a one when this specific value is a BISCO, for example, and the rest will be filled with zero and so on. So what one hot encoding will do is it will create a separate columns in our data set so that each values of those columns will be filled by a one or zero based on the values of the original column. Mm. Is, is, is this clear, Mohammed, or in the trends? Uh, not actually. Okay, so let's say we have a column which is, uh, which is named Iceland. So it will contain Let's, uh, in our case, it contains three ex three values, which is the first one is the BISCO. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, and so on. So when we perform one hot encoding, we are changing or converting the values of that column, which is the Island column, into numbers or numerical forms. So what one hot encoding will try to do is it will separate out or take each of the values from this feature or column and we'll create a new column. So if you have about 10 different values in this specific uh, feature, 
it will create 10 different columns. So on each created column, it will fill the values a zero and one. The only specific values that you are expecting from the newly created columns are zeros and ones. So it will give a one when the original value was, uh, when the original value matches with the newly created column and it will give a zero when it doesn't match. So let's say your data is aligned this way and the first one is, let's say this has an ID of one, the second has an ID of two and the third has an ID of three. So when we perform one hot encoding, it will create a new column for each uh, values of this uh, feature. And for the created columns, it will assign a value one when it matches uh, this specific row. For this row, it's the value is Visco. So it will give a one, but the others aren't in this row. So it will give a zero. And for the second, for the second value, uh, it will assign a one in this specific row but the other columns will be assigned to zero, which uh, in other words, it means uh, they are not present in that specific row. So for the third uh, value of the column, which is the dream one, it will assign one for this specific column for this specific row, but the others will be assigned to zero. Uh, is it still confusing or, Ahmed? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Okay. Uh, is it clear for no, everyone good. or does anyone has uh, any question? Okay. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask if you have a question or it's still unclear. Uh, I think when we uh, look at Label encoding, it, it, it might it might become much more clear. So in label encoding, what it will try to do is instead of creating new columns, it will give or it will label the data based on the based on the order, not based on the order, but based on the value. So let's say we have about one, two, yes, we have three different categories here. So the feature color has three different values, which is which are red, green, and blue. So for each of the values in that specific feature, it will create or it will label those values into numbers. So the first one might be red, so it will label it as zero. Then the next one might be green and it will label it as one. And the third one might be blue and it will label it as, it will label it as two. And when we get through it, it won't label it as three or four or any other number. Since it's already, the value for it is already registered as zero, it will give that specific value again. So for each of the values or for each of the categories we have, what label encoding tries to do is it will give or assign a specific values for each, uh, for, each, for each of the value we have in the feature. So red will have a specific value, it might be zero, and green will have another value, which is one, blue is two, and red will be again zero because it's already assigned a zero. So let's say we have another categories, uh, maybe uh, blue, black, and so on. Okay, blue is already present. Maybe black, orange, uh, and so on, any other colors. So it will give a new number or it will assign a new number for each new column and for each new value that we have in our feature. So there won't be any other additional columns or additional features that label encoding will create, but rather it will try to assign each values in the column and a new value. So they will be represented by the newly created value or newly assigned value in the uh, new data that is being generated by label encoding. So the difference between one hot encoding and label encoding is that one hot encoding will create additional columns for each different categories that we have, but in label encoding, it will create, it won't create additional columns, but it will assign a new value, a new numerical value uh, in, in, in the same uh, column or feature that you have. Okay. Is it clear what the difference between label encoding and one hot encoding? Maybe if I, Okay. Yeah, uh, I just have a quick question. Yeah, yeah, go on. If I may. So, uh, 
So are we going to use uh, the level encoder for ordinal uh, categorical data when we have or orders in the features? Uh, yes, most of the time, I think it's recommended to use level encoding, but I think there is also uh, the ordinal encoding uh, algorithm that can be used for ordinal categorical data. Uh, but I think label encoding can also be used because label encoding will label data based on uh, their sequence or their arranged way. Yeah, okay. Underneath? So basically, the one hot encoding uh, creates. Uh, a column for each row it gets from a specific feature. So, uh, wouldn't be uh, very expensive to create if there are like uh, thousands of columns, or like there are thousands of like a unique elements in um, the uh, feature. Uh, you are referring to the one hot encoding, right, Sandernet? Yes. 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 Uh, I think. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this was what I was going to talk or what I've been talking earlier. So I think let's just see this section. Uh, when are we going to use label encoder and when are we going to use one hot encoder? So we are going to use label encoder because one hot encoding is really expensive in terms of resource, as Andrenet has said, uh, and because it's going to create additional columns for each of the different values that we have in our column. We are going to use label encoder when the number of categories is quite large, as one as one as one hot encoding can lead to high memory consumption. When our when the number of values or when the number of unique values in a feature uh, are lot, we won't use one hot encoder, but rather we will be using label encoder. And when the order does not matter, we will also use uh, label encoder. And we are going to use one hot encoder when the order does not matter in the categorical features and the categories in the feature are fewer. So we'll only be using one hot encoder when the uh, number of values, number of unique values in that specific feature uh, are not uh, many or the, there are less number of unique values. So we won't use one hot encoder for or when the number of different values in that specific feature are lot. So I have another question, if I may. Okay. Uh, uh, the, can you just scroll a bit up? Uh, no, no, like the, down, the opposite. Yeah, yeah, okay. there. Like uh, it says that we, we use uh, the hot encoder and uh, the label encoder when the order does not matter in categorical features, like. Uh, in, mm. in both, in both, like there, the order, like we use them when the order of the categorical feature doesn't matter. So, which one do we use when the order uh, does matter for, for instance, for ordinary categorical data? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up as well. Uh, I think I, I might have misled you guys earlier. Uh, we won't use uh, the categorical or the one hot encoder or the label encoder when the categorical data is uh, ordinal or the order matters. I'm sure that there is a type of ordinal uh, not from yes, there is a specific uh, encoder which will be used for ordinal data. Sorry for that, guys. So. In the scalern, we can use the ordinal data. We are going to see the implementations of label encoder and one hot encoder, but uh, when the type of categorical data is ordinal or when the order matters, we are going to use ordinal data because the orders are uh, uh, the, the orders matter when we are going to build the machine learning algorithm. So we won't be using uh, one hot encoder or label encoder. For the, sorry for that, guys. Uh, is that good, Anjanet? Yes, yes. Okay, Joseph? Yes, uh, my question is about available encoder. Uh, okay. I think that 
once we use that, we transform the, the data into numerical data, but those numbers uh, don't make sense, I think. So uh, how do the model use them? I, 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 I can guess that it will use them as numerical future, but is it good for the results? When, it, when we are using the label encoder or one hot encoder? No, the label encoder, because I think that uh, we don't have any problem with the hot encoder, the one hot encoder. But what about the label encoder? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I get that right. Uh, can you come right. again? My question is this. Once we have, what, once we use the label encoder, we have some. We, we we have transformed the the data into numerical data, but those numbers uh, don't have any sense, any meaning. So uh, my question is, how do the model consider that? Okay. Uh, mm, okay. So I think if I get that right, uh, let me maybe ask you back. Uh, Let's say, yes, our data or our feature, uh, the feature color has different values, which are red, green, blue, and so on. So what do you think will the word red signify if we use that in the machine learning algorithm? Do you think the machine learning algorithm will understand the word red? No, no, I don't think, of course. So we are just assigning it a new value. Uh, after all, what machine learning algorithms will try to do is it will try to put all of the values and it will try to learn patterns or features. So it might give uh, a bit uh, higher number of weights for the for this specific value or rate, uh, not for rate, but for this for the entire uh, feature. And based on the values of that feature, it will have different outputs. So what it will try to do, or the machine learning algorithm will assign different weights for each of the features. So after assigning a weight for each of the features, based on the values of the features, in our case, it might be zero, one, two, two might be uh, more important or uh, more satisfying for some specific condition or some specific output. So there might be, let's just consider, uh, okay, we haven't come to that part, but let's just consider some kind of machine algorithm, for example, a decision tree or random forest. So a random forest, it's kind of decision tree where each of the values are calculated based on uh, some specific values specified. So if the value is just, for example, it, it's not exactly as, uh, as I'm going to explain, but let's say when the value is two, it will choose some specific tree, uh, part of the tree. And if the value is one, it will choose some specific part of the tree. So it will be traversing through the tree based on the values given. So it won't understand the words that we are going to give. That's why we are assigning a specific value or numerical value for our machine learning algorithm. Oh, okay. But I would like to be sure that the model used them has, numeric, has a categorical uh, future even if they are numeric, they, are, they, they, are, they have been coded. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry? I would like to be sure that the model use, use a, the model consider them as a, a categorical variable which have been, uh, uh, okay. I think, coded. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it won't, the, the model or the final model that you are going to build won't know if the uh, if the, if these specific values have been encoded from a categorical column. We are going we are just going to give these specific values to our machine learning model. So the machine learning model can work on the algorithm uh, can work on specific uh, kind of uh, things on the underlying uh, sets of the algorithm that it's going to implement, and it's just going to give us an output. We are just encoding it so that it will be in a form or in a format that is convenient to the machine learning algorithm because the machine learning algorithm won't understand the words that we are going to give it. It just understands numbers. Okay, I get it.
but there is no point uh, for the machine learning algorithm to understand if it, if the data has been encoded or not because we are just making it suitable or we are preparing our data to feed it to the machine learning algorithm. Yeah, but I would like to know if you don't think that it's a limitation that we are using the categorical feature has a numerical one. Isn't that a limitation of the way that the computation is made? Uh, I, I mean, uh, what if the word red, uh, the word red, green, and blue will only be significant or uh, will be in a way that is understandable for humans, right? Yeah. You, you can understand if I say if something is red, the color of something is red, green, or blue. But for the yeah. machine, there won't be a problem if you encode that or change the formats. Uh, let's say the color red in another language might be something else. Let's say, just for example, it might be a number in some other language. And those people in, the, in that specific language can be able to understand and communicate each other using those uh, encoded formats or uh, those numbers in their language, right? Yeah. We are doing the same thing for the machine learning. We are just changing the format to be understandable by the machine uh, that's going to use the values from that specific feature. Yes, but now I would like to take an example. We suppose that we are using a linear regression model. Uh, okay. And uh, maybe the, the model needs to compute a mean, a mean value okay. for a feature. So I think the model will compute the mean value of that one, but the value, uh, uh, that mean, doesn't have any significance. I don't, I don't know if you, you get what I'm saying. I, I didn't get the last part. So you were uh, talking about the linear regression and yes, the features. Yes, okay. I, I suppose in, I realize that in a linear regression, we will we, be using, uh, we will be computing the mean of each future, right? Yes. For example, so if I take this one, so, uh if we compute the mean we will we will get a value but uh we without any meaning so that is my point of value my my worry yeah yes i, I what i'm thinking I, i'm not exactly sure but what i'm thinking is that there are some kind of loss functions in linear regression in any other types of machine learning algorithm right so yeah let's we use the mean squared error or Yes, let's say, let's just say use the MSC or the mean squared error uh, for your linear regression as a cost function. So every time you go or you implement the forward propagation or when the machine completes the first cycle, it will try to evaluate the results. So based on the results, it will penalize the weights of those specific features or uh, it will try to increase the weight of those specific features. So that's how a machine learning algorithm is trained. It will try to adjust its weight and it won't give much of a value for, the, for some specific features. And it will add uh, the weight or the importance of some specific features based on the cost function implemented. Right. So See, if that specific the, feature that, that we have encoded... Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, is that clear or...? Yes, it's clear. I, I'm, I see, I'm seeing now how it works. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Tamar? Yes, uh, uh, regarding the uh, this uh, uh, hot, uh, hot encoding, yeah, label encoding, I still have an issue. Uh, okay. I don't know if we are using, we are advised to use uh, label encoding uh, for uh, for features uh, conver conversion, or it is for the output. The reason I'm asking this is because when I was reading uh, about uh, feature transformation, they say that if you use uh, one label encoding, the machine, uh, the the algorithm will just assign a uh, high weight for those who has have like in our case 
the one who which has two will be assigned more weight than the one who uh, which has two uh, what, zero. So I'm confused if we are we are advised to use this for future conversion. Uh, yes, I think you are correct. Most of the time, when you use label encoder or uh, some similar uh, algorithms to encode our data, the machine, the, the, the algorithm will try to assign more weight based on the values given. But uh, that's what we have to work more, especially when we are tuning our parameters, when we are choosing our cost functions for each of the uh, algorithms that we are going to use. But uh, I think label encoding is mostly used despite the, uh, uh, the the effects that it produces, it's mostly used for encoding categorical columns, especially when the number of values, the number of unique values uh, uh, are higher than uh, the other categories. When the categories aren't that high, we will most of the time use the one-hot encoding, but when you have uh, many number of categories in a, in a single feature, we will be using label encoding. Okay. Okay, any other question? I think the time is also going. So uh, if you guys at least understand the main, the main concept about one hot encoding or in the label encoding and the reason that we are going to use uh, these specific algorithms, I think uh, we are good to go. So the next step when implementation, what we have to do when implementing the, uh, the label encoding is we will first uh, separate the numerical columns from the categorical variables. So we can use df.selectD types. So based on the data type of the column, we can uh, take the numerical columns and we can separate it from the categorical columns. So we can use the df.selectD types. Select underscore D types is a method on the data frame that has been loaded. So after converting it, you can print it out. So we can see that the numerical columns are age, trust, PPS, call, and so on. And the categorical columns are the six CP, FPS, and uh, so on. So we'll just try to explore our categorical columns. After exploring our categorical columns, we will be splitting the categorical columns for one hot encoding and label encoding. Because uh, as I've said earlier, when the number of unique values in a specific feature are uh, high, we'll be using label encoding. But uh, when it's not, we'll be using one hot encoding. So we'll be using this list compression by using uh, in the if else statement, we'll be using if the number of unique values are less than 10 and greater than two, we'll assign them to uh, to, the, to the variable to one hot encoding. But if not, we'll be assigning them to label encoding for the columns or to, for the features that aren't in the uh, to one hot encoding uh, variable. So when we print that out, we can see that in the one hot encoding, we have some features and we'll also have some features in the label encoding. So the features that are in the label, in the label encoding, the number of unique values aren't, yeah, uh, are very large, but in the one hot encoding, the number of unique features aren't high. And we'll also check if there are any null values and we can see that there aren't null values. And we, I think we'll be good to go to uh, further preprocessing or one hot encoding and level encoding. So for the one hot encoding, we can use the pd.getDemis. And what pd.getDemis will do is it will encode the data and will create additional columns for each of the uh, for each of the unique values that are in that specific feature. So we'll pass all of the columns that are uh, labeled to one hot encoding and we'll uh, get the result. As you can see, uh, yes, a new column has been created for each different unique value. So there might be a column named CP. Mm, yes. There is a column named CP, and what pd.get dummies uh, did was it appended or it appended the value or the unique value in that specific feature. So the feature was CP, and it appended the value, the unique values in that specific feature. So CP underscore then the unique value one, the unique value two, the unique value three, and so on. So for each of the unique values, it will be appended to the 
columns and uh, a new separate column and will be created uh, for each of the unique values. So this is how one hot encoded column can be implemented. You can also use one hot encoder. I think that's the better approach that you can also use the pd.case dummies. And for the label encoding, label encoding, we can loop through each of, there is uh, a library we, which we can use from the scalar. And for each of the columns in the, in the column list of label to label encoding, we can iterate through each of the columns and you can call the fit transform method inside the label encoder method that we have instantiated above. So after changing, after encoding it using the fit transform, we can append the new columns to the list that you have initialized. And when we print that out, we can see that a new column has now been created, but each of the values have been uh, put using zero and one and so on based on the number of uh, unique values that are in this specific feature. So for the six feature, we might have about, uh, let's say 10 or 20 unique values. So it will assign the, the values based on the features that we have, based on the values that we have. So it will assign zero, one, two, three, and so on until 20. And for this will go for the FBase and Xang as well. So finally, what you can do is you will merge the data that has been encoded using the label encoder and the one hot encoder. And we can create a data frame that has been uh, completely encoded in, in a format that is suitable uh, for the machine learning model. So after encoding it or after concatenating all the features, which are the numerical feature, X contains the numerical feature and the one hot encoded columns contain the features that has be, that that have been encoded using one hot encoding and the label underscore encoded columns contain the features that has been encoded using the label encoding and we can print them all out and we can see that uh, a new data has been created or a new type of data has been created because of the one hot encoding new additional features has been added to uh, our data set and we can use that for our machine learning training so the next step is to split the data based on the label that you have. So our label is the target label and we'll assign that to Y and we'll drop the target variable from uh, our training data set. And after, training, after dropping that, we can see that uh, our data doesn't now contain the target variable or our label data because it will be used for training in the evaluation of our uh, training data. So using the train test splits from uh, sklearn, we can split our data uh, here we use 0 0.33, but uh, we can split it based on the uh, number of uh, rows that you have in our data, and we'll split it to X train, X test, Y train, Y test, and uh, we can get that split based on our test size we specified. And for the training models, we have a couple of algorithms that, that we can use uh, to train our data. And we'll just go over some popular ones and the most commonly used one. And the first one is the random forest. And random forest uses a supervised kind of learning and it can be used for classification uh, as well as regression. So uh, random forest or random decision forest is an, assembling, is an assembly learning method combining multiple algorithms to generate better results for classification, regression and other tasks. So each task individual classifier is weak, but when combined with others, it can produce excellent results and it can handle both continuous and categorical variables. So uh, random forest was used or uh, was generated from separate trees or separate decision trees that have been implemented in the decision tree algorithm. But in the decision tree algorithm, one of the weakness was uh, it had a, a higher variance. So when we combined different trees or dif multiple decision trees, uh, we can reduce the variance and the bias as well. So random forest used the technique, which is the bootstrapping and final aggregation. And uh, finally, it will choose the most dominating terms for the classification. But if it was a regression problem, it will take the mean or the average of the outcome. So it can just be used for classification or regression in this supervised way. It is a supervised way of, way of learning. In this entry, as I've said, uh, it is part of, uh, it, it just uses a single decision tree to make a decision. So it's a flow-like tree 
structures of branching method to illustrate every possible outcome of a decision, and each node within the tree represents a test on a specific variable, and each branch is the outcome of that test. So on the same tree, there is a single tree to be used for the decision making, but uh, in random forest, we'll be using multiple decision trees to make uh, a decision or a specific prediction or classification problem. So random forest will have low, va low bias and low variance because this entry will be overfitted because it will try to study the data, the training data, uh, based on each of the values that are in the features. And when it sees new data or announcing data, it will not perform well because of overfitting problem. So random forests will uh, try to tackle that by using multiple trees and combining the uh, outcomes or the outputs of each of each uh, decision tree, and it will try to average them with this linear regression problem, and it will try to uh, pick the dominating factor or the dominating output from the outputs when it is a classification problem. Uh, the other and most popular one is the logistic, the logistic regression classifier. When it comes to classification problem, I think the first thing to use or the first thing that most people use in the industry is the logistic regression classifier. We can use it, it's very simple and uh, it will only use values. Most of the time it is used uh, in binary classification uh, in which there are only two categories to be classified. And I think when there is multi-class classification, we can use uh, uh, different uh, activation function. In, we'll be using sigmoid when it is binary classification. Uh, by, binary cl by, by binary classification, I mean that the outputs we are expecting are two, which, are, which might be zero or one. For example, uh, when an email that is being sent to you is a spam or not, that's a binary classification. Uh, but uh, we'll be using multi-class classification when, when the output isn't on uh, okay, I'm sorry for that. So we'll be using multi-class classification when we have multiple outputs and uh, we'll have a different activation function. I think this is mostly used in deep learning and other approach, but logistic regression will be, will be able to classify our data or our training data into sets. It will use zero and one, and it uses the sigmoid activation function in the output layer. And the next ones are the Bernoulli naive, the naive bias and the Gaussian naive bias. So these are statistical algorithms that will try to predict or that will classify our data based on statistical features or probabilities generated uh, on the algorithm. So based on some kind of statistics being implemented, it will generate a probability for each of the classification that will be generated. So using a probability, it will try to classify our data. And the next algorithm is the K nearest neighbor. So K nearest neighbor is a supervised way of learning. It's not related to the K means uh, algorithm, which we, have, which we have seen in week one. In week one, you have seen, you should have seen the K means uh, algorithm. A K means algorithm is unsupervised learning, which, will, which is mostly used to cluster data uh, into a specified number of groups, but the k nearest neighbors will, is a supervised learning which will work uh, on a labeled data and uh, used mostly in a classification problem. And the last one is the XGBoost, and XGBoost is uh, somehow newer. It's been there for a while, but uh, wasn't being used uh, as the above algorithms uh, before, but it's really popular nowadays, especially if you guys uh, uh, use Kaggle. I think mostly most of the competition that are winning uses XGBoost as their machine learning algorithm. So it's an optimized distributed gradient, gradient boosting, boosting library designed to be highly efficient, flexible, and portable. And it implements machine learning algorithm under the gradient boosting form, framework. So it was built on top of the uh, gradient boosting. So the XGBoost is extra gradient boosting, which will uh, have much more accurate results compared to uh, other algorithms, but will not be limited by their theoretical definitions. We'll be using uh, each of the algorithms and uh, look at our at how each algorithm perform in our training data. So to use the random forest, it's really simple. After importing the classifier, we can give the number of estimators. As I said earlier, for random forest, we can give the number of estimators to be used or the number of different trees 
different decision trees to be used. So we can use these and other hyperparameters in the random forest classifier, and we can then fit our data by fitting mean we, uh, we, we are saying that we are starting the training of our data. So RF.fit will start the training of our data based on the X train and the Y train. Then we can finally predict our data and have a look at the uh, first thing data that we have, the predicted data and the original data uh, that we have for Y test. So we can see that the predicted data is uh, has these specific values and the actual value uh, has these specific values. Uh, I think we can see that it's really different, but we'll see how our model is performing on the entire data. We just can have a look at the sample of our data, but we'll mostly be looking at, at the entire data to, to, uh, to see how our model or our algorithm is performing. The next one is the decision tree. It's really the same approach. We'll be importing the, the model that you are going to use, which is the decision tree algorithm, classifier algorithm. Then we'll be fitting uh, our train data and our X train and our Y train. Then we'll be predicting that. We'll be using the same approach or we'll be going over the same approach for logistic regression, Bernoulli snake bus approach and Gojan, and then the Kenya. So I think the difference is, yes, I think the difference, uh, one difference that we can see on the Kenya's neighbors is uh, we have a different, uh, we have a different parameter to be used or a different hyperparameter that you can use. So as I've said, uh, okay, I don't think I've mentioned this. So what Kenya's neighbor does is it will, based on the label data, we can, uh, we can specify a specific labels that it has to look for. So when you specify three as the, argu as the argument, this algorithm will try to uh, find for the closest three neighbors that are labeled. And based on the closest data, it will classify or it will label the newly data that is being trained based on the closest data that we, are, that we have to that specific point. So, uh, Behind the scenes, it uses the Euclidean distance to calculate the distance between the uh, specific point and to the neighboring points. So the n underscore neighbors is one of the hyperparameters that we can use and play around uh, to tune our uh, algorithm. So then we can then fit our data and finally make a prediction. So the XGBoost, it's not imported from sklearn. It's uh, installed separately using the ppackage or the conda package. And after, impor after uh, importing it, we can use uh, the number of estimator is one of the hyperparameter. And there is the other one is the learning rate. Then we can uh, fit our data or we can start training. We can use the early stopping grounds, which means when the conditions is, aren't satisfied, it will just try to look for the number of rounds that we have specified here. So we have specified, we specified five, and it means that until uh, it reached the five iteration with wrong outputs or uh, with accuracy that is decreasing than the previous rounds of training, this specific iteration will stop. So I think for those of you that are familiar with deep learning, you should be uh, familiar with this because there is an early stopping grounds or early stopping par parameters that can be used in deep learning and other algorithms. We will just specify in our model that uh, our model should stop training before reaching the iterations that we have specified or the number of epochs that we have specified. Before reaching those epochs, it will stop the training if the early stopping is reached or uh, if the model's accuracy will is decreasing continuously for five iterations. And as the evaluation set, we can use the X set and the Y set. And it, it takes a bit of different uh, parameters. Uh, XGBoost takes a different parameters compared to uh, the above algorithms. Then we can finally predict the uh, data that we have using the X test and the Y test. And I think you can see that uh, all of the algorithms are somehow similar and the way that we use them are uh, straightforward. We'll first import the algorithm and initialize the algorithm. Then we'll fit our data, which is which are the X train, the Y train. So what you guys can do on the implementation is that uh, you can create a wrapper model or a wrapper class for model training, which will just take the type of model, which can, it can be the logistic regression, 
uh, or the Bernoulli's or the random forest or so on. So one of the argument it can take is the model type, then the X train, the Y train and so on. So based on the, those specific uh, parameters that are passed to the wrapper class or to the wrapper model, we can, you can train that specific uh, model by having a wrapper class. So you don't have to repeat yourself again and again for each of the algorithms that you are going to use. You can create a wrapper class and based on that, based on that wrapper class, you can use the same fitting function, prediction uh, and evaluation functions or evaluation methods that are in that specific classes. And the next thing is the confusion metrics. So uh, after, uh, after creating our model and after looking at the accuracies or the predictions, we can use the confusion matrix. So what confusion matrix will try to do is it will uh, try to plot a kind of heat map, which will just uh, tell us how our data performed or how our training performed. So for each, there is a confusion matrix for uh, the linear regression, the logistic regression, the decision tree and the random forest. And we can see how our output is performing and how many of the data or how many of our tests passed our uh, training or were accurately labeled based on the classification model. And finally, we can also use the accuracy score uh, for each of the algorithms that we have performed, we will see the accuracy. And here we have printed the accuracy score. So the random forest was 0.83, the decision tree was 0.71 and so on. So by printing out the accuracy, we can evaluate which of the models are performing well for our training data. So based on the accuracies that we are getting from each of the machine learning algorithms, we'll choose one of the algorithms that works best for our training data and we'll go with that model for deployment and production mode. Yes, I think this is it. Uh, does anyone has, have any question? Uh, Josias? Yeah, uh, my question is this. We were talking about A-B testing and, uh, yes. and, and now I think that we are talking about uh, models. So I would like to know if it is, if using these models is doing the A-B, A-B testing in a framework of machine learning. Uh, yes. Uh, so in the A-B in, in the A-B testing challenge, we are, we are going to use multiple uh, machine learning models. So by using these specific models, these different models, we are not trying to uh, predict any values for the A-B testing. Mostly for the challenge that you are going to work on, we are trying to look at the important features for our models. By important features, okay. I mean that, uh, for example, let's say someone is performing or someone is uh, using the A-B testing to change the uh, font size or the background color of a button. Let's just take a simple example. So we are trying to get the features or the different features that are relevant for the classification or for the outcome of the A-B testing. So we will be, when you use multiple features uh, at the same time for A-B testing, we are trying to understand or we are trying to get to know the features that are really relevant and affecting the values of the outcome of the A-B testing. Okay, I get it. So it's like, uh... It's not like we use the model in order to confirm or reject the results from the classic A-B testing. No, no, we are not. We are in a sense trying to measure uh, the value. We are not trying to predict anything in the A-B testing. We are just using to get the feature importance and the relevant features that are important uh, for the A-B testing or for, for the features that are being tested. And we are trying to understand which of them are really being relevant or making a difference uh, for for the outputs that the A/B testing is uh, with, for the output that we are getting from the A/B testing. Okay, it's clear. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, Tamo. Uh, my question comes back to label encoding. Uh, okay. Let's say we in in our features we have some features that have 
some sort of uh, um, hierarchy, like education, PhD, masters, and uh, uh, secondary, and so on. Here we see that there is some sort of of hierarchy, but in our data set we also have some features that are not are categorical but not hierarchical can we use both um hot one hot encoding and label encoding at the same time uh so for uh categorical features that are that that are ordinal or their order matters in the category we are going to use ordinal encoding there is a separate method that that can be used from the scalar uh Yes, so we can use the ordinal encoding. This can be found, maybe I will drop this link. You can just Google it and you can find it from the scalar library. You can use the ordinal encoder to encode categories that are ordinal. But for categories that aren't ordinal or uh, for categories where order doesn't matter, you can use uh, label encoding or one-hot encoding. My question is using both methods are the same um, i mean during the feature selection and uh, pre-processing for the machine learning algorithm is uh, it possible uh, to use to use them at this i mean for for you can is it possible to separate those which has a hierarchical you no know, i mean where the, the order matters and the other one where the order doesn't matter and concatenate them after just uh, doing those uh, procedures. Is it possible? Yes, yes, yes. Here uh, uh, on the notebook that we just worked, we use one hot encoding and label encoding together, right? After working on both types of encoding, we concatenated the features that has been that have been one hot encoded and that have been label encoded, right? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So in the same way, we can concatenate the features that are encoded using original encoding, label encoding, uh, or one hot encoding. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other question? Mohammed? So, uh, in terms of uh, numerical values or numerical columns, um, let's say that, that we have uh, a lot of unique values in that column, and that's in that number column hmm. what type of encoding we should use uh in order uh to encode that label uh okay so when you have a large number of unique values in our feature we will be using label encoding you can find that in the notebook so we'll be using label encoding when the number of categories is quite large as one encoding can lead to high memory consumption so We'll be using a uh, label encoder when the number of categories, when the number of unique uh, values in that specific category column uh, are large. But if mm -hmm. not, mostly if they are less than 10 or, yes, if they are less than 10, we can use the one hot encoder. Even even uh, if our value, or all of our values was unique, so that, uh, let's assume that we have uh, 10,000 uh, mm -hmm. rows and uh, we have 9,000 rows are unique values. Uh, mm -hmm. In that specific situation, we should use uh, label encoding. Uh, OK, I think that's a good question. Uh, in the ordinal, not in the ordinal, in the one hot encoding, what you can do is uh, <clears throat> you can take the sample, or you can specify number of samples that you want to use. So let's say uh, if there are thousands of unique values in a specific feature, you might not need to use all of them. So what you will mostly do is you will sample the most repeated or the most frequent values and you will set the others to zero. So you can, there is a method called dot sample on a one hot encoding. And when you use one dot sample, you can specify the number of features, not the number of features, but the number of values that you want to sample. So if you specify, let's say 20, if you specify the number 20, 
the algorithm will try to take the top 20 or the most frequent values that are in the data set, the top 20 most frequent data, the data values, and it will put a zero to the other uh, values. Because uh, <clears throat> in a categorical element, sometimes there might be values that aren't that much relevant or that are just used once or twice compared to the other values, which are be used thousands of times or hundreds, hundreds of times. So that those features that aren't used frequently or that doesn't appear frequently uh, won't affect our model that much compared to the other values that are appearing frequently in our model or in that specific feature. So you can replace those with zeros and we can only take the features that are uh, appearing frequently in our uh, in our feature or column. So, uh, okay, my last question is, um, the, do, do, do we can uh, go, let, let's assume that um, we have a column of prices of products and uh, we want to, to label or uh, to encode that column. So uh, could we group uh, amount of uh, values, let's assume that uh, from one, $100 to 1000 uh, it it uh, it represents a group one, and from one thousand to extra thousand, uh, it represents other group. So uh, that we could in, in that in that group in, in that group we could perform a label encoding. That, uh, that I, 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 I'm sorry, I lost you when you were talking about when you started from the thousand number of values. Yes. Okay. My, my 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 question is, uh, could we perform some grouping uh, so that we can group some values, and on that groups we perform a label encoding or uh, uh, one hot encoder? Uh, what do you mean by grouping uh, your data? Uh, but let's say. Uh, having a range of prices for each group. A range of prices? Yes, uh, as an as a example. Let, okay, let us so, that. Mm. Okay, okay, go. Go, go on. Uh, let us assume that we have a column of prices uh, as an example. Uh, we, we, we do not want to label all, all, all of the values, but we want to, to group uh, some values like uh, a range, set a, a range of prices. And for that range of prices, let, let us uh, say that we have uh, five to 10 groups and each group uh, contain uh, amount of prices. And for those 10 and five, Groups we we perform uh, a, a one encode one hot encoding uh, or label encoding. Okay, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure if we can do that. But for me, it seems that we are somehow clustering our data before performing some kind of encoding or one hot encoding or label encoding, right? So you're yes. saying yes, we are first clustering the. Uh, the feature that we have and after clustering those data, we are trying to, okay, I'm not exactly sure. So maybe let me just look uh, into that and let me get back to you on Slack. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, then thank you guys. The time has gone. Okay, Josias, last question. I have anything at 5.30? Yes. Go on, Josias. Yes. I have a curious, a curious question. I'd like you to shortly explain the concept of the XDB classifier. About the, X, the XGB boost classifier? Yes, XDB classifier. How does it work? Shortly, then I will. Okay, so XGB boost, XG boost uh, was built on top of the gradient boosting algorithm. So it is So yes, so it uses, it's installed, it's, it can't be imported from the scalar. It's installed using the pip. It's a separate package and you can find it in PyPy. 
and after installing it, it uses uh, the yes, it will use a decision tree behind the scenes. It uses the decision tree, and it will try to uh, first build some kind of model. I won't go specific into the implementation, but just the general under to just give you the general understanding. It will first use some kind of base model, and on the top of the base model, uh, it will create multiple trees for the base model and on that model and in that multiple trees, it will compare those results or use the base model plus the decision tree in some kind of weighting algorithm. I know I might be co co uh, confusing you guys, but it will use a decision tree, multiple decision trees and some kind of base model to be used for the algorithm. And it will finally use some kind of weighting of each values that are being returned or uh, based on the outputs from the decision tree in the base model. It will use a decision tree as the decision tree algorithm in random forest algorithm, but it won't just be using the decision tree. In addition to the decision tree, it will use a base model. Uh, a base model might not be clear for you guys unless you deep, dive deep into the algorithm's implementation, uh, but this is this specific model is kind of a wrapper, but the start behind uh, on the start behind it uses some kind of base model, then the decision tree, and some kind of weighting. Uh, I think it's called the uh, what was it called? Yes, some uh, yes, just some kind of weighting in addition to the base model and the decision tree. I think it's similarity weighting. Yes, similarity weighting plus the base model plus the decision tree. So it will combine those and will. Uh, try to come up with classification, if it's a classification, or a regression type model, if it's a regression model. But we can use the number of estimators here because we have different trees to be used or different decision trees. And the early stopping grounds is if we reach some kind of limit where our accuracy is decreasing or where we are not learning, it will stop the training. And we can also specify the eval underscore state, which will just be a matrix to evaluate our data by using the X test and the Y test and the verbose to false. This is just to control the output of the training. Okay. Is okay. that too confusing or okay? No. <laughs> I, I think it's confusing, but uh, what I suggest to you is after uh, finishing up using this specific wrapper or this uh, algorithm which is which you can import after installing it using XGBoost using uh, PIP or Conda you can go ahead and try to look at their own uh, website and you can have different resources I can also show you different resources where you can learn about XGBoost classifier the specific implementation and the stat behind uh, the implementation of XGB classifier okay now I have a question regarding the talent it's about okay. the the yes and no futures. Uh, I think that I have noticed that normally if we have yes, if you have one in yes, we should have zero in no. But uh, when I, I do the comparison, it's like uh, there are some users who uh, do not answer to both yes or no. So I would like to know what we do with them. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yes, there are some users who haven't replied at all. So, uh, when a user responds to that, uh, uh, to that question, uh, the yes label will be one. And when he, uh, when he says that that specific uh, feature doesn't impact the user, the no label will be one. And when the user doesn't respond to the question at all, both of the columns or both of the labels will be zero. So one thing you can do is you can be, uh, you, you can go ahead and try to look at the trend to the users who aren't replying, why are not they replying, is what the ad relevant to, to those users or not. And then finally, after getting some kind of trend, you will be working on the users that have responded, that have yes. at least said yes or no, by querying out only the, uh, the feature, the rules that have a one in the yes or no label. Yes, that I have noticed that uh, plenty of the users 
uh, we didn't reply. So yeah, we had yeah. a lot of the users. Yes, most of the users didn't reply. So as I've said, just try to be creative and try to look at the patterns or why those users haven't replied. Uh, you might not get much. If not, it's okay. But for now, try to work on the users that have replied okay. and try to get the importance, the feature importance uh, for each of the labels where the user said yes and where the user said no. Well, if it is that we have less than uh, 1,000 rows, 1,000 users to consider, even less than yes. six threads. Yes, yes, yes. Because if they haven't replied, you can't uh, exactly know or uh, you can't get the feature importance for the replies. So you can't make sure that your ad has worked for this, 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 and these features, and your ad wasn't working because of this, this, and these features, right? Yeah. We can That's only good. say that the ad is working when the when we get a reply from a user. And if it is that, worry about the A-B testing. I'm thinking that normally it should make sense to remove them before before doing A-B testing. Uh, yes, for the machine learning module, you will only carry out uh, those that have replied. And and worry about the A-B testing. Uh, for the, uh, What do you mean by the A-B testing? Uh, for the A-B testing, when you are going to implement the classical or the sequential one, you are just yes. trying to, you are, you are just trying to understand if the specific ad, you are, you are not being concerned about the labels or the outcomes. You are just trying to understand why you, which users or if that specific ad and those specific features are working uh, for your users and actually bringing some kind of change. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, if that's it's it, clear. thank you. We have, okay, just us. It's clear, clear. Okay, nice. Thank you guys. Uh, if there are any further questions, you can go ahead and ask it on the Slack channel. And yeah, good.